Hi, Jason. Jason. Hey, how are you, Will? Pretty well. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. You're doing pretty well. I am Will Wilkinson of uh, the Cato Institute here in Iowa City, Iowa, and you are Jason Brennan. Uh, I assume you're in Providence? Yes, I am. Uh, Jason, uh, tell uh, our audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I'm Jason Brennan. I work in philosophy at Brown University, um, and currently I'm working on developing a liberal theory of civic virtue, uh, one in particular that emphasizes the uh, contribution from private sorts of activities and de-emphasizes political participation. And uh, I guess what we're going to talk about today is a, a piece of that. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thanks for coming out. This is, uh, of course, it's political uh, season. We're going to be mm-hmm. voting uh, for the next president of the United States uh, in uh, about a month. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess by the time this airs, it'll be less than a month. And uh, and you see on TV, you know, like there's all the rock the vote sort of stuff. Uh, you're constantly, you know, besieged with uh, voter participation propaganda every time uh, a new election is upon us. Uh, mm. and, uh, and 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 I've always found that a little bit questionable. Um, but it's, I guess, a piece of received wisdom that uh, a healthy, strong democracy is one in which. Basically, everybody goes to the polls. Uh, that if you have low voter turnout, uh, pundits come on television and complain that uh, you know our democracy is weak or that people have no sense of civic responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why I found your paper uh, that is forthcoming in the uh, Australasian Journal of Philosophy. Uh, so uh, tantalizing and provocative. Uh, so we're, we're here on Blogging Heads. We're so cutting edge. We're going to talk about a paper that hasn't even been published yet. It's coming out uh, next year. It's called Polluting the Polls When Citizens Should Not Vote. And uh, Jason mm-hmm. has an argument uh, to the effect that uh, not everybody should vote all the time, that it would be better if some people uh, stayed home. Mm-hmm. So, the, so the the main premise of your argument, Jason, is that People should not vote badly. Um, That's right. Who do you think disagrees with the idea that people should not vote badly? Well, in some sense, uh, you know, there are lots of people who think you should vote well. Um, mm-hmm. And so the people that say everyone should vote all of the time, and that's really important. And, um, but a lot of people in the liberal democratic camp and others uh, think everyone should vote and everyone should vote well. So it's an implication of their for you that uh, you shouldn't vote badly. But my position is a little bit more unusual, and I say... You don't have to vote. I don't think you have a duty to vote. It's okay not to. But if you do do it, you ought to vote well. And the analogy I use to start to motivate that, though it's not central to the argument, is uh, you know, it's sort of like being a surgeon. You don't have to be a surgeon, but if you are going to be a surgeon, you better be a good one. Um, if you're, you don't have to be a parent, but if you are going to be a parent, you ought to be responsible about it. Uh, and if you're going to drive, you don't have to drive, but if you're going to drive, you should do it responsibly. Uh, but there are actually, I think, kind of the common sense view among a lot of people is just, no, go ahead and vote. However you vote is okay. So probably the average person disagrees with this. Yeah, so uh, so the idea, uh, I mean, when, when you put it that way, I mean, it mm-hmm. just seems it just seems incredible. You know, you, you don't have to be a surgeon, um, but if you're going to be one, you know, don't, you know, cripple someone for life by not knowing mm-hmm. where to put the knife. Uh, the, you, know, you know, voting isn't brain surgery, um, right. and, uh, and, and it seems like there are, you know, lots of benefits from, you know, like, like, uh, you know, part of living in a democracy is just having this sense that people are, you know, sort of part of a common project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so certainly, you know, there, there must be benefits to, to people voting, but, uh, but you want to argue that if, if people vote badly, um, mm-hmm. they can actually harm us right, like right. and so so what and in the analogy you make in the, in the title is that is that voting badly can be a kind of pollution. So like any yes. individual who doesn't know what they're doing is ha- going to have an insignificant effect. Um, right, but they shouldn't contribute to something that's not an insignificant effect. That's right. Yeah. So a bunch of things are going on there. So one, just to start off, for people who aren't aware of this, so. You know, people talk about what's the expected utility of an individual vote, and it's extraordinarily low. So, you know, uh, Jeffrey Brennan and Lauren Lemaski wrote this book called Democracy and Decision in 1993 that is sort of this, even still is kind of the state of the art on uh, what the utility of votes is. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can, 
you know, you can calculate the expected utility of an individual vote, and using their formula for any sort of realistic election, even if you're voting for a disastrous candidate, the expected disutility of your vote is extraordinarily low. It could be thousands of order to, orders of magnitude below a penny. So the argument that I make in this paper, it doesn't turn on your individual contribution. Your individual contribution is negligible. Rather, it's about the fact that you are taking part in a collectively destructive venture. And I think what I try to argue is that morality requires you, under certain conditions, not to take part in such ventures. Mm -hmm. So there's a, the, the uh, well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, to, to, to make it clear about what you're not saying, uh, about okay. the, uh, the uh, sort of infinitesimal magnitude uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of a, a single person's vote in a, uh, right. in a, in a l large democracy. A lot of people, uh, sometimes you get the rational choice argument that, that there's just no point in voting. It's irrational to vote because... Mm -hmm your vote has no significant causal impact on the outcome. Um, right. And you're not saying that people shouldn't vote because it's irrational in that way. Uh, no, you, no. you think that that should... It's, the fact that my vote is not going to turn the election, you think that that should have... Do you think that that has anything to do with whether I choose to vote or not? Uh, it probably has something to do with it, though I... I think sometimes it can be rational to take part in a collectively good process, even though if you're bowing out, won't make a big deal. Or maybe it could be morally appropriate too. Like if we're all on a rowboat together, um, you know, a very large rowboat with thousands of oars, uh, you know, you're deciding not to row might not make a difference, but it's still right. probably good for you to contribute your part. I, I don't think it's bad for you to vote for that reason. In fact, the reason I bring up the, the disutility of individual votes is that mm -hmm. it's going to be an objection to the argument I make because your vote counts for so little, even if you vote badly, why well, think you shouldn't do it? It's like, it's triflingly, it has such a trifling harm. You're, as it, it considers an individual vote, you do so little harm, why well, think you shouldn't do that? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so right. Maybe and, should, and, but, but that argument, uh, you know, if that was true, uh, it, mm -hmm. this gets us into the sort of the heart of the idea of of, uh, of a collective action problem of, of, mm -hmm. of some sort. So I, a while back I had a, uh, a, 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 I don't know if you saw this, there was a, and I might have mentioned this before uh, on Blogging Heads, but uh, there was, somebody had written into, uh, you know, that Ask Philosophers website? Um, uh, no, actually I don't think you, I no, Yeah, I there's, a, there's like this website where people ask questions, uh, just uh -huh. like, you know, like, it's, you know, like Dear Abby. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then like, Philosophers, some of them very prominent, uh, will give their answers. And, and one of the and one of the questions that somebody had asked was, uh, my, and it was by someone from someone in the UK. And he said, mm -hmm. uh, "My sister's getting married in Australia. Uh, in light of the, you know, the carbon that I would emit by getting in an airplane, mm -hmm. uh, should I go?" Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and Thomas Poga. Uh, of Columbia University's, it, it basically was like, no, don't go, right? You have a responsibility not to contribute to yeah. uh, the sort of degradation of the atmosphere through global warming via the release of carbon. Now, this doesn't matter. Yeah. The, guys, the, guys, the contribution of this one airplane is going to be, you know, infinitesimal. Uh, this yeah. guy probably isn't, wasn't even the decisive passenger. The plane probably was going to fly whether or not he got on it. Right. Uh, but still, there was this idea that, that you know, the idea that seemed to be in Poga was that 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 he had a moral responsibility to not contribute to this harm that mm. an individual can't really do anything about. But if we yeah. all act jointly, we could make a difference. Yeah, good. So I think I'm not sure if I, I probably wouldn't agree with Poga in that particular case, but I do use a kind of reasoning, but it it's, makes a sort of weaker claim that he's making. Mm -hmm. So uh, the outline of the argument, like in the kind of most basic form, is. I think morality requires, requires you not to engage in collectively harmful activities provided the cost of restraint to you is low. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and then voting badly would violate that kind of general norm of not collect, engaging in collectively harmful activities, and so voting badly is out. Um, maybe we should say something a little bit more about what it means to vote badly. Yeah. Um, so as far as this collective action idea, so you know, a lot of people are familiar with this idea of the prisoner's dilemma um, where... Um, or they might be familiar with something called the tragedy of the commons. And I'll go with the tragedy of the commons case as an example. So the idea of a tragic commons is um, we might all have this resource that's held in common. None of us really own it, but we're all using it. Um, and you might be in a situation where you kind of can't control people's access and how they use it. If they start abusing it and overusing it, 
um, kind of taking, extracting too many resources out of, the, or bits of resources out of this common resource, they might start driving it down into the dust. Mm -hmm. um, and you might think, well, you know, should I refrain from, from taking pieces of that, or sh is it okay for me to take extra resources as well and contribute to the degradation of it? Um, in a case like that, uh, it, it would really require a lot to ask you to stop um, damaging the environment. Uh, David Smith has a paper where he talks about this with regard to fishermen who are using uh, fishing around um, uh, some uh, coral reefs, and other fishermen have started bleach fishing. They dump bleach in to kill the fish, and that mm -hmm. can collect them in mass. And he says, in this case, if you're one of the fishermen that doesn't want to do this, you can't stop the others from doing it, and you're kind of stuck having to do it as well, because that's the only way you're going to be able to catch fish and then sell them on the market to make enough money to, to feed your children. I mean, mm -hmm. because other people are harvesting so many fish at once, if you use traditional harvesting methods, the ones that are friendly to the environment, um, you won't be able to sell your fish for enough money to feed your kids. So it's like, right. in that case, you know, it's just really onerous to tell you to back off. But yeah. voting doesn't seem to be like that. Um, if you back off from voting badly, it, it, it might hurt a little bit because you do get a little bit of a psychological payoff from voting. You feel mm -hmm. kind of good about yourself after you've done it. But... The cost to you is really pretty low. You could just watch TV or something instead and feel just about as good. Um, so here, it's it's such a weak thing. Don't engage in a collectively harmful activity, provided that the cost to you from disengagement is low. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think, you know, a number of kind of plausible background moral theories are going to imply that. Uh, you know, in the paper I talk about, here's what a Kantian would say. Here's what a rule consequentialist would say. Um, here's what a eudaimonist might say. And then I think you can also kind of give a kind of argument from common sense sort of ar argument from fairness about this. And the idea is, like, if we're all collectively creating a harmful, you know, a bad thing, we're all collectively creating something dangerous for all of us, then, you know, um, we sort of equally should share the burdens of uh, eliminating that problem or fixing that problem, or maybe in proportion to how much we're contributing mm -hmm. to it. Um, so Poga is using a similar line of yeah. argument, but... His is requiring something rather onerous, like don't go to your sister's wedding. Right. Um, whereas mine is much, it's much weaker. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was baffled when I saw that because I was like, well, you know, this this will have almost no effect. Plus, mm -hmm. I mean, like, so if I was thinking in terms of, uh, you know, some, you know, I don't know what the intuitive moral theory is, but that I have these sort of very strong uh, sort of, you know, obligations to people that I have certain relationships with, like my sister. Mm -hmm. And, like, what kind of person yeah. would that make me if I just, like, didn't go to her wedding because I didn't want to emit a uh, completely trivial amount of carbon into the atmosphere? I yeah. think that would just make me a, 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 a jerk. Um, yeah. so, 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 and that would be onerous. Uh, that might cause strain in my family, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. But in this case, in the case of voting, it's just uh, staying home Tuesday night. Um, yeah. Now the the question the, now now your point isn't that people shouldn't vote it's that people shouldn't vote badly, badly. and so that right. if people if there's enough people voting badly uh, they're sort of jointly contributing to uh, bad effects so so mm. first of all let's say, let's talk a little bit about what it means to vote badly and okay. and and then let's try to think of some examples of how a lot of people voting badly together can scale up to have really bad effects so that yeah. we can get a sense of why this is important. Okay, good. So when I say you shouldn't vote badly, I don't mean that to be a tautology, like true as a matter of logic. When I say you don't have a duty, I don't mean voting badly is by definition a thing you shouldn't do. Um, so instead, I use voting badly to mean something like this. You vote badly when uh, you vote for a, a policy that's likely to be harmful or for a candidate that's likely to enact harmful policies. And as far as what counts as harmful, I kind of leave this as a commonsensical idea. You can feel free to put in your favorite theory of harm. Um, you can feel free to take whatever side you want as far as cosmopolitan versus nationalist debates or something in between, mm -hmm. where cosmopolitanism is the thesis that every, when you're thinking about harm, you take, take consider everybody's harm uh, worldwide. Nationalists think you just think about the harm and the good you're doing for people within your own country. Um, I'm neutral as far as this paper goes on that, though mm -hmm. I'm not neutral in, in person. Um, so you, you put in your favorite kind of theory of harm, or you'd say voting badly could be voting for unjust policies or for po con candidates likely to enact unjust policies. Um, so that's what I have in mind. And some examples of that would be things like, suppose you know Alex believes that blacks are inferior and should be treated as second-class citizens, and he votes accordingly. Well, that would be an example of bad voting. You're voting for an unjust policy. Or 
uh, if Bob believes that, um, you know, maybe Bob is just completely ignorant about uh, politics and kind of just goes in and randomly picks, uh, picks a certain um, candidate and just checks that person's name. Well, that could possibly be bad voting. It could be mm-hmm. something you shouldn't do. Because I always prefer people be... whose name is earlier in the alphabet. Yeah, that's right. And that there's a positional problem. Yeah. So there's a certain kind of view called the miracle of aggregation, which says that when you have ignorant people voting, their votes will all cancel one another out. You get enough ignorant people voting, they just vote in a random distribution. Their votes cancel mm-hmm. each other out, and only um, the smart people who know what they're talking about carry the day. And it's, as far as this mathematical theory, it, it's, it's fine. The problem is how well that model applies to the real world, where ignorant people, unfortunately, have certain biases in how they they check boxes, like they prefer the early boxes to the later boxes and things like that. So it's not even clear that ignorant voters vote in a random way, because if they did, it would be pretty harmless. Mm -hmm. Um, And then another example would be, um, you know, after reading Brian Kaplan's Myth of the Rational Voter, which uh, did, you know, inspire me to think of this problem in the first place, uh, you know, he talks about people having economic biases and so on. And so you can also think of a person who might, say, have a really good goal in mind. She wants to promote national prosperity and make people richer and, you know, help Mm -hmm. the poor and everything. But just because she uses irrational thought processes, uh, you know, she she develops her views about the economy based on what makes her feel good rather than what the evidence implies. Uh, she decides that a neo mercantilist, neo imperialist candidate is the right one to bring about national prosperity, and she votes accordingly. And that's that would be another example of bad voting. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, this is uh, something that, that 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 I actually struggled with a little bit in the paper was mm-hmm. when thinking about bad voting, um, the. I mean, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of things that that could mean. So when you say that people shouldn't vote badly, one thing you could mm-hmm. mean is that they shouldn't vote in a way that will have, um, that will be contrary to whatever your favorite value theory is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that person's you know, value theory, the individual voter's or just, value just theory, just the correct value theory. And that's not your idea. Yeah. So, so when you say, so I suppose I'm a utilitarian, and I think that mm-hmm. that uh, our, you know. Everyone is morally obligated to maximize utility by their choices. Yeah. To vote badly relative to that theory would simply be to you know, support candidates and policies that were not utility maximizing. That's not yeah. what you mean, right? Uh, I, I could mean that because I like to, I want to leave it relatively open. Um, mm-hmm. What counts as a harm here? Uh, it's a sort of commonsensical, and it may be you know the utilitarian has the best account of harm. Uh, I'm not an act utilitarian, so I, I don't personally endorse that. But I think this is compatible with the utilitarian sort of view. It's compatible with a Kantian view. I think it's kind of compatible with a common sense moral view, where what we mean by bad policies are policies that create unnecessary wars or uh, disenfranchise certain groups or harm minorities or uh, exploit the few for the sake of the many or lower national prosperity or... Uh, you know, destroy economic opportunities and things. I mean, that's that's really what I have in mind. But I, you know, want to leave that open because the argument doesn't depend upon a particular account of harm. Um, I try to leave that open as much as possible. It's sort of a module, and you insert your best theory in that module. Um, Jason, I'm all of a sudden off screen because I realized my computer wasn't actually plugged in, and it might oh. die in one second. So hold on, one one moment. Sure. This is the uh, kind of glitch that is the charm of blogging heads. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. And we're back. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. So, okay, so another thing that, that then, then was uh, a, a question that I had is when you. So we're leaving it open, it's, and I agree with you that your idea is pretty neutral relative to mm-hmm. lots of different uh, sort of moral conceptions. Um, mm-hmm. But is the idea then that uh, it, when you say that people shouldn't vote badly, should they not uh, simply not vote badly, or should they not vote just in case they are justified in believing that they would vote badly? Um, because that uh, seems like a completely different thing. Most people yeah. are not in a good position to know whether or not they would vote badly. And that seems really yeah. persuasive that if you think you would vote badly, then you shouldn't. Um, yeah. but, uh, but it seems less persuasive that if you would vote badly relative to some moral standard that that's kind of external to you in some way, and you don't mm-hmm. see how you would be you know, undermining 
goodness according to that standard by voting, then why do yeah. you really have a reason to not vote? Yeah. Okay, good. So you bring up, actually, you bring up a point that I kind of forgot when I was talking about the definition of voting badly. Like, as a first pass, I say, you vote badly when you vote for bad or unjust, or sorry, harmful or unjust policies or candidates likely to support harmful or unjust policies. But as a kind of second pass on a definition, I say, well, maybe we should make it, a, put in a clause that says, without sufficient reason. Because you could be justified in thinking that this policy is going to be good rather than harmful or that this, right. pro- this will be just rather than unjust. Um, so, you know, you can be justified in having views even if the views turn out to be correct. I, I give an example, like, suppose, like, the past 200 years of work by thousands of independent political scientists all points towards one policy being good. And then we implement that policy, and surprise, it turned out to be bad. It turned out to be harmful and get the opposite effects of what we expected. Well, you might very well be justified in thinking that was a good policy, and um, you know, you, you didn't vote badly even though you voted for something that turned out to be harmful. So I want to leave open that you can be justified in believing something that turns out to be wrong. Um, and so you could, if you have sufficient justification, like epistemic and moral justification, you might end up advocating a policy or voting for a candidate that turns out to lead to bad, uh, harmful effects, but you're kind of off the hook. You didn't, you, you didn't do something wrong in that case. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't mean it to be something like, if you sincerely believe it to be right, then you're automatically doing an okay thing. I think you can sincerely believe something to be right and be deeply mistaken and be culpable for believing it to be right. I think that's probably very common in politics where people's beliefs about what is good and just and what will bring about you know, national prosperity and, and what will help people they're often very sincere in these beliefs, but they didn't really put in much work to uh, kind of meet minimum epistemic standards as far as uh, as far as whether those are beliefs are correct or not. And so, mm. you know, sincerity I don't think is sufficient. Uh, you have to kind of earn the sincerity. Yeah, it, seems, it strikes me that a lot turns on then what what account of uh, epistemic justification that mm. you go with here. That, that 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 if you if you say that people shouldn't vote. Uh, on the basis of unjustified beliefs, say, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, to, that to vote on the basis of unjustified beliefs would be to vote badly, yeah. um, then, uh, you know, there's lots of very, very stringent uh, notions of justification, uh, yeah. which then if you bought into one of those, uh, you'd pretty, it would pretty much imply that nobody should ever vote. Um, yeah, yeah. Th- th- but, you know, because it's hard to it's hard to you know come up with a good idea of the justification of moral beliefs in the first place. Um, yeah. It, but even if you don't go, use a stringer, a very you know, so so the most stringent standards of epistemic justification tend to be certain kinds of uh, internalist standards where yeah. the the individual is supposed to sort of like you know reflect on a particular belief see that it cohere, coheres in the right way with their other beliefs. And so you, there, there's a lot of work that an individual has to do on some internalist views of justification in order for them to be justified in believing anything, that they have to sort of, you know, have sort of validated it internally. Um, yeah. But even according to, like, a lot of externalist theories, uh, so a lot of externalist theories, say a reliableist theory, is going to say that your belief is justified uh, just in case... You formed it according to a, uh, a, a a process that tends to represent the world accurately or tends to yeah. track the truth. Um, now, so if you just formed the belief just because uh, you think that Barack Obama is going to have the best consequences because everybody you know thinks that, well, just thinking yeah. what everybody else thinks isn't a reliable uh, method of truth tracking, so you're going to be unjustified and you're going to vote badly. Whether or not you... Um, sort of know uh, or would think that you're unjustified in that belief on reflection. Yeah. Yeah, good. So, you know, another thing, a lot of what this paper does is it kind of gives the main argument that answers various objections. And another kind of module I kind of stick in there and say is about epistemic justification. And I say this is compatible with a wide range of epistemic theories. Um, Most of the theories that most philosophers endorse uh, are not very stringent as far as justification. They're sort of they're, they're much more minimal than that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I don't want to kind of say, throw in your favorite episom- uh, epistemology here as well. Um, now, yeah, so I think I do give some examples of irrational thought processes. Like I talk about somebody voting for a candidate and saying he must he must support good policies because he's so good looking, and that's not a reliable process. You know, 
believing stuff because other people believe it. I mean, we are, I don't, you know about social, social epistemology, and we do get a lot of our evidence for the world and how the world is based on other people's testimony. Mm-hmm. So sometimes getting the testimony of others is going to be um, a reliable guide to yeah. uh, if what Jason you should Brennan believe. Jason Brennan tells me something, I'm going to believe it, you know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not reliable. I only know about, you know, I'm a philosopher. I only know about sci-fi roles and things like that. But, uh, you know, if you go up to a physicist and ask a bunch of physicists, uh, hey, ex- you know, what sorts of particles are there in the universe? Well, their testimony is pretty good, and you can just take that as evidence. You don't have to actually go do the experiments yourself. Uh, now, as far as, like, you know, other people voting, you, know, you voting for Obama because all the people you know are voting for Obama, um, that would be some evidence on behalf of Obama if it turned out that other people were pretty reliable. Uh, you know, politics probably isn't a case where you can really generally trust people. Uh, they don't have a lot at stake in getting the truth here because uh, if you if you don't know the truth about politics, it doesn't make much of a difference. It's not like, you know, if you, if you don't know the truth about whether there's a car on the road you're about to cross, you get hit and you get hurt. So mm-hmm. you have a really high... Uh, stake in knowing the truth here about politics n- not so much it's more about you have more incentive to say express certain values or project a certain self image and things like that so it's not as obvious that people tend to be reliable there plus politics is just pretty hard I mean I wouldn't want to set such a high barrier um, standard of evidence that it turns out no one is ever justified in uh, having their political or moral beliefs but um, it is hard to know about policies I mean think of I'm reading all these experts talking about this economic crisis going on now and the bailout. And these are people who spent years on mm-hmm. uh, on economics, and they don't know what to make of it. Um, so there are going to be cases like yeah. that. And I think it's probably pretty hard for the average person to know a lot about policies. I mean, actually, Tom Cristiano, uh, who is um, a faculty member at the place where I went to graduate school, he wrote a really great book on democracy and said, you know, picking policy is too hard for the average person. What political parties ideally should do is they come up with lists of ends. Here are the goals we're going to support, and we're going to give them roughly this order. And mm-hmm. what you do is you pick, as a citizen, you would pick between political parties based on the values they're espousing, because as a citizen, you're pretty smart about values, if not policies. You, mm-hmm. know, you have enough training to know what's right or wrong. You just don't have enough training to know how to get the good stuff. And then the, he thought, it'd be great if uh, the um, political parties would then kind of bring in experts who would help them figure out the policies that are needed to bring about that list of ends in that order. Um, and I think that's a, a wonderful vision. Of course, it's, I just don't think it's highly likely we'll ever get something like that here in the world. In fact, p- political parties, not only do they espouse various ends, they also give you a set of policies they're going to try to implement. Um, mm-hmm. And so you know, when, you, when you buy Republican, you're buying certain policies. When you buy Democrat, you're buying certain policies. And it's yeah. often a lot of people are in a position to judge those policies. Did they? Even if they're in a position to judge the ends the policies are supposed to support. At Christiana's point, um, I mean, I, don't, I, I haven't, didn't ever uh, read this paper or book that you're mentioning, but... Uh, the, the Rule the, of Many, 1996, Westbury yeah. Press. Okay. Read it. It's very good. Yeah, okay. well, I will. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, what just your description of it leaves me wondering is what the sort of motivation of political parties would be to... Uh, to, to do it that way. Uh, like, mm-hmm. if, if we assume that you know, political parties want to stay in power... Um, mm-hmm. Then uh, and you assume that the uh, that the mechanism by which they either are or aren't in power is just people voting for them. Um, yeah. Then uh, then it's hard to see what their incentive is to sort of defer to sort of you know third party experts on issues. Mm-hmm. If if you know because if I ask what would be the best economic policy for the United States and the, and, the, and the experts come back and say you know outsource all the jobs uh, mm. that is going to mean that you don't get elected. Um, yeah. And so that you, and so basically the, you're going to end up in lots of situations that if you listen to the, if you listen to the experts, you'll be punished for it. Uh, yeah. you need, you would need the public to demand, uh, policies based on expert knowledge and they certainly do not demand it. No, they don't. Uh, they often get resentful of that. They they worry about elitism, um, and you know, people they like they like to think they're smarter than they often are, uh, or they know more than they often do. Uh, you know, Tom's worry. Or maybe I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, if I'm getting it wrong. It's been a while since I read it. But what, what Tom is talking about there is uh, what should be done ideally. What mm-hmm. would be better? A better way of running politics. He's not. I don't think he thinks it's particularly feasible. Sure, that people would work this way. So you know, he's talking about a better way to run things that we probably can't achieve. Um, you know, actually, there was, you asked me a question earlier about, mm-hmm. 
you know, episode of Justification, and there's a little piece of it I forgot to uh, mention in response. Sure. Um, so one thing about this paper it, that's kind of interesting about it is that it's probably self-effacing in the following sense, that it's not so obvious that, you know, let's say everybody watches this show or better, or, you know, or reads the paper um, and they get to see, like, the real argument and, like, what the various pieces are and everything. It's not very obvious that this would make the world a better place as judged by the standards of the paper. It might be that if people hear about this argument, um, it, it will induce bad behavior rather than good behavior. So, uh, you know, in an unscientific thought experiment, or sorry, in a scientific experiment, I talked to a person who I thought exemplified political irrationality. He just formed his beliefs on the basis of really bad evidence and what he found flattering rather than what was true. Um, and I said, here's this idea I have. People shouldn't vote badly. Uh, they shouldn't vote when they don't have certain moral or epistemic justification for their beliefs. And he's like, I agree, other people shouldn't vote. And then there's a worry that the kind of person who's likely to take this, this view seriously is likely to be rather doubtful of themselves, like I am. You know, I, I tend to think I'm, you know, I have a lot of beliefs, but I'm also very cautious about them. I think I, I make mistakes all the time, and I worry mm -hmm. about, you know, I, I hold myself to a high standard of evidence, and I worry that I fall short of it. You know, people like me, they might read this thing and go, oh, I probably shouldn't vote. I don't want to mess up. So there's this worry that if this were widely publicized, uh, it would make the world worse by the standards of the paper. There's a similar kind of view with the, the, uh, certain the, kinds of... So the least biased people would be mm -hmm. likely to... It, the reason that you have the least biases is probably because you're most worried about your biases. Yeah. Right? And so, so yeah. the least biased people would be the sort of people who would be like, hmm, maybe, maybe I don't know enough, I shouldn't vote. And yeah. the most biased people are going to be the ones who have a, just a completely irrational self-assessment. They're like, well, I know everything yeah, yeah. about politics. I listen to Rush three hours yeah. a day. Uh, I mean, and, you, yeah. yeah, you and I talk to a lot of, uh, we spend a lot of our time talking to extremely competent people who know a lot, and they're usually not incredibly confident in everything they think. They're very <laughs> hedging, and they can tell you all the stuff that's wrong with what they believe. Whereas, you know, you talk to people who often don't have that level of competence and don't have that level of justification, and they're, they're, it's just obvious that they're right. Like, how could anyone think otherwise? Um, so this isn't a manual for civic education. It's the goal is to sort of identify a problem and say, you know, morality requires you not to engage in this process, not to mm -hmm. not to vote badly, but it's not to fix the problem. It's not to sort of offer a solution. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and one thing also just to clarify too, because people wonder about this, because I, I, you know, people have blogged about this paper a little bit, and you see these kind of knee-jerk reactions from some people who just saw like one paragraph from an introductory uh, section of the text. And they go, you know, who is this guy, Jay Brennan, to take away people's right to vote? So I'm actually not, I think that everyone should have a right to vote. I think they should have one, uh, one vote per person. I don't think there should be any sort of competence exam for voting. I think you should just, you, you, reach, you reach adult age, you're minimally competent, like you're, you're, you know, you're not like, put in an institution because you can't handle it yourself, you get a vote. Um, so the idea that I'm advocating is morally compulsory but politically voluntary uh, duties not to vote. Like, it should not be enforced, um, in part because I think there would be certain injustices that take place if it were enforced. I'm not, I'm not sure that – I think you might have a right to vote even if you shouldn't use it because uh, the right to do something doesn't necessarily imply that it's right for you to do it. In the same way that I have the right to free speech, I could write a pamphlet advocating slavery. I'd be wrong to, but no one should stop me from doing it. Mm -hmm. But also, for public choice kinds of reasons, I think if you had an agency that was trying to um, – assess whether people were competent enough to vote, that's the kind of agency that special interest groups are going to try to capture, right. and it's just ripe for abuse. So you wouldn't want that agency. I mean, if it were run by angels, that would be one thing, but it's not going to be run by angels. It's going to be run by the people that run this country, and, yeah. and they're not doing such a good job. Yeah, in, in their book on uh, uh, Deliberation Day by, uh, mm -hmm. by Bruce Ackerman and I'm, I'm blanking on who the other, Fishkin uh, is the other author, James yeah, Fishkin, I don't either. And, I'm and, and, and and so they have this idea that that that, that uh, there ought to be a national holiday, Deliberation Day, in which mm -hmm. uh, citizens are given the day off. Uh, there might even be like a, a sort of cash award for showing up um, to incentivize people who, um, who who really can't afford to forego the work. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea is that we we all go to our local sort of uh, you know vote, place of voting you know the the local high school gym or the you know the basement of a church, and we sit around and we deliberate about the policies of the day, right? Mm -hmm. And to, in order to improve the quality of voting uh, and to mm -hmm. improve the quality of deliberation between before uh, before actually deciding, and 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 they've done some things called like deliberative polling where they take people into these groups where they 
have a discussion leader who runs them through certain issues, and they find that people uh, change their minds often after uh, going through this deliberative process, um, that, mm-hmm. that, that, that the polls turn out differently before and after, so that yeah. the, 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 the deliberative process has an effect. But then they, one of the elements of this is that there are these people, these sort of discussion leaders, and mm-hmm. that there are uh, you know, packets with information that educate yeah. citizens about the uh, uh, about the issues, and you mm-hmm. know, I, I think this. I mean, this sounds like a great idea. Uh, um, like, th- th- it would be better if people were more informed. But if you can imagine yeah. that we institutionalize the idea that there are going to be a certain number of people who get to control the discussion about what yeah. the uh, w- you know about the most important issues of the day, and that there are some other people who compile the informational packets. That are handed out to everyone when they ca- that is going to be. I mean, it it sounds like this wonderful civic thing, but mm-hmm. as soon as you start thinking about how it would be implemented in an adversarial political world, you just yeah. know that the right to determine what goes in that packet is going to be just like a bloody battleground of mm-hmm. ideology, right? And 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 that's one of the things that's difficult to think about when thinking about democracy in particular. We've got a democracy, um, but a lot of times, and 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 we it, it does what it does. Um, but when you read political philosophers, as you were saying about uh, Cristiano, they're they're often doing ideal theory, right? They're trying yeah. to come up with a theory of what uh, things would look like under ideal circumstances in which people are, you know, well mo- morally motivated and have been brought up under just institutions and mm. so on and so forth. And so it's hard to know what to do with that stuff when you're actually yeah. thinking about actual democracy, how, you know, about how relevant it is. Right. Yeah. I, I find a lot of this stuff on democracy and the idealization kind of, it's, it's sort of in this nether world between what's really ideal and, what might be something that could make this world a little bit better, but like a feasible good improvement. Um, you know, so democracy I don't think is really ideal. Like in an ideal, literally ideal, best imaginable world, we get together and we live together well, but we have no government whatsoever. I mean, that's utopia, and that would be literally ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then in this world that would never work. Uh, you know, some people who might watch your show maybe are anarchists. I'm not one of them, uh, but... You know, in this world that won't work, so we want something that will improve things. We have to take into account the fact of human corruption and, and stuff like that. And we can we can try to alleviate that to some degree, but we can't get rid of all of it. I think any institutions we want to make the world better, we'll have to assume that people will try to abuse those institutions for their own ends sometimes. Uh, so, you know, I, I like to talk about institutions being like tools. And, uh, you know, if ideal conditions, so if ideal theory is asking something like, what institutions would you choose in the attempt to realize justice under conditions where everyone has as strong a sense of justice as is possible and everyone is competent to play whatever role they're assigned by society and you have favorable background conditions? What institutions would you want? Okay, well, there's an answer to that question, um, but it might not have very much to do with an answer to a different question, which is what, inst- what institutions would you want to get as much justice as you can under conditions where people have varying degrees of competence and they have varying degrees of uh, strength of their sense of justice and often depends on how altruistic they are often depends on what they're being asked to do um, and there aren't always favorable background conditions so mm-hmm. if uh, ideal conditions call for a hammer um, you know which one set of institutions then non-ideal conditions might call for a wrench something very different um, so you know I think the the vision that you're talking about with having deliberation day I think there is some benefit to that and it might it's something worth considering and looking into the empirics of it mm-hmm. uh, I think they're probably overly optimistic I don't know if, there's this work by uh, Diana Mutz or Moots, M-U-T-Z, I don't know how to pronounce her, pronounce her name. Um, and she's done some really interesting empirical work on, and she, some others as well, on the connection between participation and deliberation. And what mm-hmm. she says is that participatory Democrats, it, as a matter of fact, participatory Democrats tend to be bad deliberative Democrats, and deliberative Democrats tend to be bad participatory Democrats. So the kind of person who's really engaged in politics and joins lots of clubs and quasi-political mm-hmm. associations and things, those people tend to be ideologues. Uh, they tend not to be very good at considering the other side. They tend not to have necessarily very good evidence on their own views. They're just in it full, mm-hmm. like wholeheartedly. Yeah. The people who tend to be good deliberative Democrats, um, the ones who you know, can reflect very well and talk to people who, people who have a lot of cross-cutting political discussions and talk to people with whom they disagree, mm-hmm. um, the ones who can articulate reasons on behalf of the views they disagree with, they tend not to be good participatory Democrats. They tend to uh, stay home, not vote, or if they do vote, they choose whom to vote for late. They don't join a lot of associations. 
Uh, so we're living in that kind of world. If we could overcome that, if we could change, you know, if like this effect maybe is not necessary, it might be that certain institutions would bring participation and uh, deliberation together. That would be great if we could do that, but I'm not so sure we can. Well, that, so, so that makes it sound like the people who are most strongly politically motivated are, again, the people who seem to be most inclined to bias in their views, mm-hmm. which, which yeah. is a question that I just wanted to ask you. Like, I, I, I know you're, you, you know, you try to stay neutral relative to the the the, the right value theory and the right theory of uh, of epistemic uh, justification. But so, mm-hmm. what percentage of the American population do you think is actually capable of voting well, uh, just according uh, to whatever your personal standards are? According to my personal standards. You know, I say in the paper, here's an account. You you might be filling some of these details here with theories from other philosophers, and then it would take a social scientist to go out there and uh, do some some work to go figure out how many people meet these standards. And I certainly haven't done that. Uh, uh, if I had to guess based on whatever evidence I have, you know, probably like thirty to forty percent. I guess uh, you know that might be about right. You know, and, and the thing is, it I might be higher, high. it might be lower. You think that's high? Okay, you probably yeah, have higher well, standards than I do. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it, it, this is the thing that's that that's astonishing when you look at like the uh, you just like public opinion work. Just the percentage of people who don't know who their representative is is yeah. astonishing. Uh, and if you yeah. don't know who your representative is, then you know, uh, you know, a forty or you don't know which candidate represents which view, yeah. right? So, so if you actually are voting without even knowing who the people that, which which it would seem to indicate that a, that a very large percentage of the people who vote um, didn't actually had maybe heard of the people that they are voting for on commercials yeah. or something, but people don't really have a very good view of what it is that they even stand for, right? So, yeah. so, so I mean, there's one set like. W- a kind of casual, I think, generous notion of being well informed would mm-hmm. simply to say that the person knows who the candidate is, mm-hmm. and in sort of very broad outlines, knows what policies yeah. they favor. And I think yeah. even according to that standard, you'd get an incredibly low number of people who would be uh, who would not vote badly. Yeah. Well, there is a question on what are the relevant things. So people say, oh, you know, most Americans don't know how many people sit on the Supreme Court. And it's not clear that's the kind of information you need. Yeah. Uh, I'd much rather people know which way demand curves and supply curves go than they know how many people are on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, but um, what information do you need? And actually, there's a really nice discussion of, of those kinds of questions somewhere. David Eslin has a, a new book called Democratic Authority where he talks about how parents might fail a lot of these kinds of exams. They won't know a lot of particulars, but they still are pretty good parents. It might just be like some kinds of information aren't as important as others. Uh, in defense of the average person, um, you know, I think you, you don't know maybe much about your particular uh, uh, congressperson, but you might know oh, quite a bit about, well, what kinds of things do Democrats tend to do? What kinds of things do Republicans tend to do, um, at least on the national level? Um, and maybe you, that will give you enough information to know whether you should vote by party or something. Uh, so, you know, if I get a, a typical, if I, you know, I can kind of guess what the average Southern uh, Republican senator is like and, you know, probably have pretty good reasons to think, like, when I evaluate mm-hmm. that Southern Republicans' views, I probably have a pretty good, even though I don't have to necessarily have seen what they are, I could come up with a guess of what he's, he or she is likely to support, and it's probably going to be roughly accurate. Uh, so you might be able to be justified, even if you don't know about the particular person. Mm-hmm. Um, but it will depend. I mean, again, you'd have to know, you'd still have to be in a state to really evaluate the kinds of policies that the average Democrat um, favors. And, you know, and you'd have to know something about how much division there is within the Democratic Party. And if you don't know those things, that yeah. you're not in a state to be justified about those, then you're not going to be able to be justified in voting on that particular yeah. person. And, I mean, um, and, you know, there's also, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just saying, I think it's, it's, it's worth pointing out how undemanding that is. I mean, that, mm. that, that, mm. that if you thought that, which seems plausible, that a, a, that a certain kind of competence, uh, a, a desirable level of competence would include some idea about the relationship between um, policies and their likely consequences, that, mm. it, that, that if what I care about is... Um, a, a, a you know a higher personal income yeah and 
but I have no idea what the relationship between uh, sort of protectionist trade policies might be or or the, the relationship that um, sort of high tax rates might have on the level of economic growth that will in turn mm-hmm. affect my income. If I have no idea about how different uh, policies will affect that thing that I value, mm. um, then it seems like I'm not in really a very good position to be choosing wisely uh, among. Yeah. Uh, uh, but 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 once you've got to that point, you know you've gotten really demanding, and you've cut yeah. out almost everyone. Um, and, yeah. and and that, even though that when you just state it that way, it seems that seems like you should. It, you know, it would seem plausible to think of that as a minimal requirement of competence. Yeah. That you would have some idea about the relationship between your values and the policies likely to realize them, but if yeah. you if you actually insist on that, almost everybody's out of the picture. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe on the best account of justification, it turns out nobody meets this level. Um, I don't think that's actually a disaster for the view. Uh, I think you know it might just be that we live in a world in which very few people do the right thing. Uh, I don't think that's that's possible. I don't think mm-hmm. that's what the tells against it. Um, you know, maybe it's more aspirational. In which case, you might say, you know, you have this obligation not to vote badly, but it might be one obligation among many, and maybe it's outweighed by some competing consideration. Maybe it just turns out that in order for democracy, no one ever votes well, everyone always votes badly, but in order for democracies to survive, we need to have a certain percentage of people voting badly all the time, Mm -hmm. um, so that the duty is outweighed by some contrary duty or some other contrary consideration. Um, I guess I'm not as pessimistic as you are, though. I think... (laughs) Probably, I think probably about 30 to 40 percent of people vote well. You know, there's something like, uh, you know, an optimal level of participation among people. And it yeah. might be, you know, actually this is kind of a worry for my view. I think I have like an idea of the optimal level of participation, and I think it might roughly be close to what the actual level is. In which case, you might think I have like some sort of status quo bias or something. Yeah. So yeah. You see, I'm very, you know, I'm skeptical about myself. So, so you, one implication of your view would be that law, like mandatory voting laws, promote mm-hmm. immorality. Uh, they could, though you, you could imagine that you institute this law and as a result, all sorts of people start taking voting more seriously and they start becoming very well informed and they vote very well. I mean, that might be the case. That's an empirical question what will happen. Uh, if that doesn't happen, though, if, if all that happens is you get more participation and you get more voting and it's dumb voting or irrational or immoral voting, then, yeah, it promotes immorality. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's like if you, if you required everybody to write a book, so everyone, as a matter of law, has to write a book. Well, you might get a lot of very bad books written. I mean, maybe you'll get <laughs> wonderful literature. Maybe people will take this very seriously and they all write wonderful books. I, I don't think they will. Um, I think they'll probably write a lot of bad books. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in favor of compulsory voting laws, uh, in part because I, I don't think – I think it's just inherently unjust to do that. Uh, I don't think it's a really major injustice. It's not up there with, like, enslaving people, but, um, you know – still, it could turn out that empirically they do pretty well because they inspire good behavior from people. Well, it's kind of like, I mean, you could see it as an analog to, uh, you know, the government heavily subsidizing the automotive infrastructure. And by subsidizing it, they make the relative Mm -hmm. price of driving so low that everybody drives and therefore pollutes. Uh, You know, it might be something like that. It's not... It's not a huge injustice that the government yeah. is, uh, is is subsidizing the automotive infrastructure and thereby encouraging people to um, uh, to, to to contribute to a collective action problem. Um, yeah. But but it would be better if they did if they didn't do it. Right. right. But how about yeah. this view? So so suppose your view. So you know, suppose we were taking your argument seriously as a bit of ideal theory that that that, that and and that people grew up in society. You know, that, that part of your social studies class in sixth grade was, uh, it really gets drilled into you, that part of what it means to be a good citizen, to have civic mm-hmm. virtue, is to be well-informed. Uh, mm-hmm. And that when it comes to voting in a democracy, it's just, um, it's a civic vice to vote uh, badly. It's a civic vice mm-hmm. to vote on the basis of ignorance or on the basis of biased beliefs. So people yeah. take this seriously and people really do. I mean, like people who don't really know much about politics, they like, yeah, it would be wrong for me to vote. I'm not going to vote. Um, I should abstain. Yeah, I should abstain. Uh, and they do. But isn't that then going to be a world in which you have kind of rule by the better informed person? I think uh, Esalen calls it epistocracy. And, yeah. and, and then when people who are better informed are the ones who are being decisive, 
Well, th- that attribute, being well informed, tends to correlate with other properties of people, like their income level. Now, it's going to correlate mm-hmm. with the level of education that you have, and that correlates with the level of income that you have. So, aren't you actually asking for a uh, a system in which sort of wealthy, educated people run everything? And, yeah. it, and then, how are people who are less educated? And poorer supposed to look after their interests in a system yeah. like that, where they take seriously the idea that they shouldn't vote if they don't know enough. Yeah. Well, a couple things. One, way back at the beginning of that comment, you said, you know, civic virtue means being well informed. I don't think it actually means being well informed. I think you can exercise incredibly good civic virtue despite being completely apathetic about politics. Right. Right. Um, you just there's a whole story I have to tell about that. I'm working on this thing called civic virtue without politics. Uh, so I don't I don't buy that. It's just if you do vote, you should be informed and right. and relatively unbiased and relatively justified in your views and have relatively good moral beliefs. But okay, but back to the epistocracy part. So uh, you know there's this worry that what I in effect advocate is having the the rich and the educated and the good I guess the the more virtuous people rule. And Eslin asks a really good question. Like, you might be smarter, but who made you boss? And you can have variations of it. You might be more virtuous, but no one made you boss, or you know, who made you boss? Or mm. you might be, uh, you know, more rational, but who made you boss? Uh, and I think there, there's something really worrisome about epistocracy. In, in particular, when he's using the term epistocracy, the main thing he has in mind is people by right who are more intelligent or more educated having more power. So mm-hmm. giving extra votes to people who are better informed or have, right. better, have education. Um, but there's a version of the worry that you can, like, as you've just done, that you can play against my view. So I wonder about, like, is there a loss of power here? You know, Tom Cristiano says when the, uh, when the few rule and the many and the rest don't engage in politics, and that means that you have the rule of the few over the many. Um, there's a worry about that. So, you know, I, I can use a couple analogies here that I think might undermine some of the worries there. So one is, you know, we've all been at... Uh, Let's say we're out going to dinner, and I'm in. I've come to visit you and your friends in a new town. Well, you know, we're trying to decide where we should go. Well, you guys don't by right get to tell me where I have to go. I I really should have an equal say. But if I have this goal of uh, picking the best restaurant for all of us, then because I'm so ignorant about the town and what foods are good there and what places to go, then the way I can exercise my equal power as you know a member of the dinner decision committee is just by abstaining. You know, in effect, it's an indirect way of voting. It's the way I, what I want to do is bring about the best outcome. I don't know how to do that, so I vote that my vote reflects your collective wisdom, and the way that I make that vote is by abstention. Uh, so there, it's not so obvious I've lost any kind of power or control over myself, and you guys are probably still, you're, you're still going to look out for me in one way or another. And, and as an empirical claim, uh, political scientists have done quite a bit of work on this. It looks like the typical person, when he or she votes, doesn't vote for narrow self-interest. They typically are voting um, for what they perceive to be the national interest. Uh, they just often have incorrect perceptions. Mm. Um, I think they often have in- incorrect perceptions. Um, so, you know, if people are irrational... And they might have immoral, conveniently biased perceptions. So they might be sincere, but their yeah. belief yeah. might be rigged in favor of their class. Yeah, Yeah, and the... Right, but, you know... When people work on, you know, what, what do people of various classes tend to believe, uh, let, let's say Brian Kaplan is right about uh, the effects of rational ignorance, or sorry, rational irrationality on people's beliefs about economics. Now, I'm not hereby endorsing his view. My, the stuff I talk about here, it, it could be true even if everything he says is false. If he's, mm-hmm. if he's right, that doesn't add any actual support to my view because he's making a descriptive claim and I'm making a normative claim. Um, but suppose he were right. Uh, he says that, well... One implication of his theory of what's wrong with people is that you know the the lower class people actually don't tend to vote in their own interest. They don't tend to vote in the national interest either. The uneducated, they just the uneducated and the irrational and so on. They just don't tend to know what's good for them. And so it would be better for them if other people voted. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the other people might be biased, but not as biased as they are. Man, but, uh, but, but like that. I mean, the people people like when they hear that, it, mm-hmm. it just sounds like a kind of. Uh, paternalism that that look mm-hmm. like you're you're poor you're ill educated uh, you don't know what's best for you um, yeah. just let us look after you um, yeah. and so maybe you have the, the 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 political science evidence on your side and it says that 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 poorer people or less educated people 
uh, are so ignorant about politics that even if they do participate, they're not going to be effectively acting as agents on their own behalf because they won't yeah. pick the policies or the candidates that actually yeah. advance their interests. So they ought to keep it, leave it up to the better informed people. But but still, that just seems, I don't know, that just seems slavish. Yeah, it, there's something worrisome about it, right? Uh, I mean, first of all, you know, saying, you know, the argument is really just, you should not impose bad governance on other people. Mm-hmm. Now, it might not be your fault that you're in a position where the best you can, like, you don't know how not to impose bad governance on people. It might be that the educational system has served you very poorly and the system has been kind of built against you or without much consideration of you. Um, and so it's, you know, kind of too bad that you're not in a position to vote well. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that would necessarily excuse you, though, from saying, mm-hmm. like, well, you shouldn't vote badly. I mean, if you go and vote, like, the problem there is a lack of education, a lack of opportunity, a lack of resources. Go fix that. Mm-hmm. That's what you want to work on. Don't worry. I mean, don't say, well, then they should go vote because it's not even in their own interest to vote. They're going to vote badly. They'll vote for policies that don't promote um, the the national interest and don't even promote their own interest because they, they aren't, if ex hypothesis here, they're not in a position to know what's, what's good, what will bring about good outcomes. Uh, so fix the other stuff. Fix the root of the problem. Um, you know, does it seem slavish? I, I don't know. I, it's like, if I go, I'm not in a position here, not, I'm not in a position to vote well here, I don't know enough, I'm choosing to abstain because I recognize what, what I want to do is bring about outcomes that are good, and mm-hmm. I don't know how to do that. So I'm choosing to abstain, I'm choosing to let these other people make the decision. You know, I'm, I'm authorizing them to make the decision. It's not the same thing as them taking the decision away from me. It's not the same thing as them imposing a decision on me. I'm authorizing them. And, you know... A lot of people, they don't want to get involved in the day-to-day drudgery of politics, and they kind of allow other people to take care of it. But there's always, like, there's actual participation versus sort of potential participation. Mm-hmm. Like, you could jump up and rise up. If you start to see that the uh, the people who are voting are taking advantage of the fact that others aren't voting, and they're voting in their own interest against the national interest or against mm-hmm. the minority interest or whatever, you can rise up and vote against them. Um, you can you can oust them from power. So uh, Jeff Brennan and Lauren Lemaski in a nice paper called uh, Against Reviving... Republicanism um, in politics, philosophy, and economics from two years ago say something like, you know, if the rulers in democracy, they don't necessarily rule at the pleasure of the masses, but they certainly rule at the absence of the displeasure of the masses. So, slavish, I think that's overstating. <laughs> um, though well, I, I think you're right, there's worry, because I think you're right, like, the, who's the average, typical person who's most likely to be bound by the duty I'm talking about? Well, it's probably not, you know people in my demographic, right? Yeah. And that's, that's a worry. It's probably well, are you, are you planning to vote? Uh, yeah, I will probably vote. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you th- think of yourself as a good person? I think I'm probably <laughs> average, morally speaking. <laughs> you're, you're average, morally speaking. So we don't yeah. know whether or not you're, uh, you think that you're going to vote well or badly. Uh, uh, so I think I'm, I'm average, morally speaking. I think I'll probably vote pretty well. Uh, better than most. Yeah, well, I won't ask you yeah. who you're going to vote for. Before we run out of time, let, 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 I want to ask you a little bit more about your uh, larger project, um, mm-hmm. because I think it's important, and uh, that, that, that people, we're constantly getting reinforced with the idea that, that what it means to be a good citizen is to be involved in politics, and you said at the beginning that this is part of a project that says that mm-hmm. that, that, that people can, you, you can exemplify civic virtue by not being involved in politics by doing things in your right. private life. Uh, could you say just a little bit more about that uh, to sort of finish sure. this up? Sure. So uh, what I, I have this theory called the extra political view of civic virtue. And what kind of motivated was I, I noticed a lot of people define civic virtue in various respects. We'll say uh, Richard Daggard will say uh, civic virtue is the disposition to further the public good uh, uh, over, say, private ends sometimes. Or other people will give this kind of account. And, you know, civic virtue is about promoting the common good or the public good and having disposition to further and having the ability to do so. And you see everyone say these sorts of things. And then they go, therefore, it means being actively involved in politics and so on. I'm like, well, where did that therefore come from? You're not entitled to a therefore then. Instead, if, if what it means to have civic virtue is to um, have a disposition and the ability to bring about the common good or enhance the common good, then you have to ask a question. Well, what's the common good? And mm-hmm. What enhances it? What brings it about? So I think if you're a liberal, and I think this is a theory that liberals should endorse instead of the kind of common, more the Republican view, uh, which is more you know, like Philip Pettit's view, which is much more commonsensical among the masses about what it is to have civic virtue. You want to have a view where uh, civic virtue allows for um, 
a lot of pluralism. There are all sorts of different ways to exhibit civic virtue. Some people do it one way, some people do it a different. I think you want to have an expansive view where a lot of activities that are not normally considered part, like political um, can be seen as bringing about the common good. So, you know, Robert, uh, what's his name? Uh, Robert Jarvik, is he the guy who invented the, the artificial heart? He yeah, did incredible Jarvik, things. Yeah. Yeah, is that right? Okay. Jarvik. So Jarvik did all sorts of stuff to uh, enhance the common good, um, but he didn't do it through politics. Um, he did it through medicine. But there's the common good, and he did it that way. Uh, Michelangelo did all sorts of things to enhance the common good, but he did it through art. Um, the average business owner is enhancing the common good, making it a better society to live in, making it more prosperous, making it so that we're receiving this bundle, of, this really powerful, large bundle of goods that we get as members of liberal democratic societies. Uh, all these people contribute to these this, these goods, but they don't all do it through politics. They do it through economic means or cultural means or social means. And some people provide good governance. Other people provide other things. On top of that, I think, even if you say, no, no, I don't just mean the common good. I mean the political part of the common good. There's still the specialization thing matters. Like The reason that some people can specialize in providing good governance is because they're enabled to do so by the other people that specialize in providing other sorts of goods, the goods that the people providing good governance rely upon, and vice versa. So I think you think of liberal society, you're talking about a large, complex web of cooperation in which we're all providing different kinds of goods, and we're indirectly... We're directly providing for some kinds of goods. We're indirectly providing for the other kinds of goods in virtue of allowing other people to specialize or enabling them to specialize. So, you know, your being a grocery store clerk is a way of it can be a way of exercising civic virtue uh, if you recognize that one, if one of the motives for doing it is to kind of promote the common good. Um, mm -hmm. In virtue of being a grocery store clerk, you're enabling other people to do their thing that promotes the common good. I mean, there is going to be an important motivational component. If, yeah. if it turns out Jarvik just felt like making artificial hearts because he thought it would be cool, he has no concern whatsoever for promoting the common good. He did a lot of good for people, but in that case, he wouldn't have civic virtue. You have to, you have, to have the right motives, not just do the, do the right things. But it's just not obvious to me that um, everyone has to participate in politics to be have civic virtue. Civic virtue just means being disposed to promote the common good, and there's all sorts of ways of doing it. I think if you're a liberal, for various reasons, you'll want to endorse this view, not the kind of more narrow, I think, desiccated view of citizenship that requires everyone to be political. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I find that uh, plausible, because uh, according to that view, then, mm -hmm. uh, then we're exhibiting public virtue right now. Yeah. Jason. Well, I'm just doing this mm -hmm. to promote my own image. Oh, uh, yeah, um, you're doing... Though, uh, we'll, we'll see. After I watch the video, I might decide that was a bad idea. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm entirely motivated uh, by, the, by, the, by the desire to sort of inform yeah. the public and to, to improve the quality yeah. of public decisions. And, I, and I'm sure we've done that uh, today. You know, I think that anybody who's made it this far in this discussion, not only... Uh, it, it's not only permissible for them to vote, but it's mandatory. Because if you uh, listen to an hour of this, uh, I think that's that's testament enough to your uh, mm -hmm. to your competence. And you should get out there and uh, and uh, do your non-duty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Good. And, and by the way, if people want a copy of this paper, um, you can go to my website, jasonfbrennan.com, um, and look on the publications page, and I'll have a. a kind of pre-print version of it up there that you can download and you can see whether, you know, you think it's more plausible in print than in words. Uh, great. Well, uh, Jason, thanks so much for coming on. The paper is Polluting the Polls When Citizens Should Not Vote, and uh, I hope you'll take the argument seriously when, uh, you know, again, if anybody who's going to read this paper, uh, okay. they should probably vote. But uh, but but I think uh, but I think it's uh, uh, something that people should be thinking harder about, and I really uh, think people should be thinking harder about the idea that you can be uh, engaged in something that's uh, you know publicly interested uh, without uh, canvassing for yeah. John McCain okay. or Barack. Well, Obama. thank you very much for the opportunity. I realize I, I looked over all the people you've had, and I'm the least famous, least significant person I think you've ever talked to. So I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, well, th thanks, Jason. Uh, I'm sure you won't be the least famous for long. <laughs> All right, so, thanks. Take care.